hey -o, I'm back. So, yeah, the game itself is free. Uh, there are some DLCs for it. Um, from my understanding, the DLCs are separate Lovecraft stories. So, yeah, I played this very briefly a long time ago. I tried to stream it, but that was on my old computer, and it could not handle it. Now, I know this is a pretty short experience. This is only about a half hour long. Uh, but it should be a nice Lovecraftian adventure for half an hour. Digon is a faithful interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work, focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here. And movement is limited to progressing through locations along with the plot. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. So I remember... During the game, you will encounter... I, I've read Dagon. I do not necessarily remember much about it. Here, let me turn the game up a little bit for you. A lot of Lovecraft's works are kind of similar, um, which is good because they do create a big, like, mythos because they all blend together really well, but it also makes it hard to distinguish which one's which. Uh, during the game, you'll encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story historical background of the author. Some of the trivia is hidden in order to find these secrets. Focus on your eyes and look for the Elder Sign. Okay. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Yeah. Well, we'll probably see. It was in one of the most open frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. Yeah, I think I, I think that I know which one this is. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. Yeah. The Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors. The masters of quick... A quick raids who also developed powerful composite bows, lassos, and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Huns as a synonym for Germans in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on the 27th of July, 1900, before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No order will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited. As just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their, their king Attila made the name made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German may, may the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. Did, were Germany and China in a war during the 1900s? The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the laws and customs of war adopted during the first Hull Convention of 1899. Okay, I'm probably not going to read much of the trivia because I don't want to take this out of the story, uh, but I'll leave it up on screen for a second so you guys can, like, go back and read it if you want.
so liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors, that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone, in a small boat, with water and provisions for a good length of time. Let's do it, let's escape. This can only go well. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Well, 1900 would have been about 40 years before World War II, which, why I was, which is why I was a little confused. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. Okay, right, we're a little south of the equator. At the moon? The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. I think I would have rather stayed with the Germans than float in a rowboat for who knows how long on the open sea. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. Yeah. The change happened whilst I slept. Oh, here it comes. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. <sighs> Yeah, it looks about right. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see. Undulations, good word. And in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. Yeah, the soil seems not The region great. was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and of other, less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within bars. hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach well, of black a slime. Boy. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. Oh. Okay, well there's there's that for you guys. You can read that later if you want. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Pardon, question. Why is that hill undulating and moving like that? Is 
See, that one I'm not a fan of. You know, I don't mind. That's a fish. A lantern. That's my lantern. Octopus, squid. Another squid or octopus. A couple of cephalopods, you know. That guy. That guy there. Treble bite. That's fine. That's a big undulating mass. I don't like that. I'm not a fan of that one. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. Yeah, we're pretty far inland, then. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. Yeah. Now it's daylight and it's still undulating. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. I can sense it undulating behind me and I don't like it. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. Alright, well, set out boldly. Yeah, just walk over the squid. I'm sure it's fine. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. Mm-hmm. I don't like these things. I don't know what you are, but I don't like you. You... I definitely don't like you right there, Mr. Three Claws. Well, that's a whale. Whale, whale, whale. What do we have here? Well, I don't like this. I don't like that. I like you. I'm sorry you're dead. Glad these things are dead. You I feel bad about, but I didn't do it. It's kind of long for the ride on this one. That night, I encamped and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock. Okay. Though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Why, oh why, are you camping near what appear to be giant worms? Like, I would simply not camp near these things. There's that for you guys to read later if you want to. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night. Buddy, I got an idea. But ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon, I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Yeah, but where would you have slept Picking the up day? my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence.
Oh, my pack. I have said that the unbroken my monotony of the pack. rolling plane was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering mm -hmm. over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost, and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Does that mean I can't, you're gonna, we can climb down Ledges them? and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent. Oh, okay. Whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Well, let's get climbing. Gotta see some more horrors down here, right? Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. Yeah, that one? That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone. I soon assured myself. Yeah, with rough. But I was conscious of food. a distinct impression that its Edges. contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. Yeah, buddy, it's a, it's a fucking rectangle. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. It's got right angles. For despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young. I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. Yeah, a lot of mud. There's a lot of mud and a giant obelisk. That's all we got. Oh, the moon, little lake. Now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm. And revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Oh, I guess it doesn't wind out of sight. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. Writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever yeah. seen in books. Seashells and fishies. Consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Uh huh, yeah, yeah. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world. Like a Cthulhu. But whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Well, there's that for you guys later. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas reliefs 
whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Dore. I think that these things that were means. supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint, grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. Yeah, they, they don't look nice. I think the guy on the right might be my favorite, though. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. You better hope that's disproportionately represented then. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. Oh, oh. Oh, it'd be rippling. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the marlin. About which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Well, shit, probably. He's all. The creature from the Black Lagoon hop out of the water. Of my frantic ascent of the slope of the cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. Oh yeah, I remember these guys. Hey, Mr. Whale. Quick, like the giant crab thing. Or I have indistinct those. recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. That's still undulating. At any rate, I know that I heard pearls of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. Out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Oh God! Now it's worse. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship, which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. Nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Okay, and there's that if you guys want to read it later. Yeah, you can go ahead and post the link, that's fine. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist. I will not. And amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Oh, hi. That's the guy.
there's that one for you guys later too. Ah, over here. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. Okay, well, that to the clock, I guess. From the book show to the clock. Just walks me over to the clock. Okay, well. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning. But I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. Yeah, it is a pretty weird game. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. This kind of a. Uh... Like, like it said at the beginning, it is just kind of a faithful retelling of, um, of Dagon, which is a very good book. I, like, it's a very short story to take you probably about the same amount of time to read it as it took me to play it, but. Hold on. Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke it when he was 12, in order to look and feel like an adult. In his correspondence with his friend Reinhard Kleiner, he, came, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. Alright. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. You like quitting smoking when you start wearing long pants? Whatever you say, man. A mere freak of fever as I lay sunstricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed. Why are you why are you using mobile? Worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink, and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. Great, climate change is going to make the fish people attack us. Just what we need. The end is near. I would, I would definitely recommend reading some. I will keep it, I will mention, um, the books are very good, the stories are very good. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against noise. it. Um, it shall not fight. he was, he wrote most of his books in the 1920s and 30s. And you can tell that he wrote most of his books in the 1920s and 30s. God, that hand. The window, the window. Dagon. 
I was enjoying. Uh, that, was, that was like I said, that was a very faithful recreation to the to the story. I thought they did a very good job with that. Um, no, I really, I really like that. But yeah, if you want, I would highly recommend. And scary stories have been accompanying men for centuries. Oh, what's this? They have many faces and forms. But what is their purpose? Why do we enjoy being afraid so much? It is very light here. Gonna... During our therapy, I'll try to... Dr. Emerson's Nocturnes. Well, we'll guide you through the Colors of Dread. Oh, it's a DLC trailer. Wow, I missed a lot of... And these are the other, like, some of the DLCs. Um, that was neat. That was cool. I like that. Help me. Pause that.